Okay, without further delay, I would like to introduce our first speaker, speaker for the afternoon, who, who many of us know, and um, it's a privilege for me to introduce. She is Dr. Maria Dominguez Bello, who is professor of the Department of Biology, Faculty of Natural Sciences of the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras Campus, and also New York University School of Medicine. She will be addressing a very relevant topic for all of us here in Puerto Rico, uh, entitled Prevalence of Helicobacter pylori and Digestive Cancers in Latin America. I will ask for the please Dr. Maria Gloria to please be here with us and present to the audience. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia, and thank you to the organizing for allowing me to come back home. Uh, I'm this year, at least uh, for now, in New York, but I have to come every month. I have two projects running here, and it's always fun to come back to the sunshine, especially these days. New York doesn't have a very nice uh, weather. <laughs> so I'm going to talk to you. I had to prepare this talk because I'm not, I don't work directly on cancer, but it's fascinating. I'm very interested in what happens with transculturation. What happens as we become modern, urban people? And what happens to the microbiome? That's, that's my main uh, focus in research. And of course, I'll, as I'll, I'll show you, uh, modernization and modern lifestyle ha is, increases the risk to some cancers. So first, let me show you that the world is improving fastly if we consider uh, economic development and improvement. This is the world map according to the uh, WHO in 1980. And we have several degrees. The world is uneven. We know that. Uh, very high development only in North America and Australia and the uh, Scandinavian countries. High development in the rest of Europe, medium and low. Africa is mostly low or unknown. Latin America is between medium and low. 10 years later, uh, no, 20 years later, in 2000, we can see more high, highly developed areas, basically the whole Europe. Latin America has developed to the point to have most of Central America and the South areas of South America with high development, and everybody else moves to medium. Africa improves a little. Africa is always lag. And the last decade, the changes in Latin America have been really dramatic in terms of development, with the South considered now highly developed. And, uh, and also is the continent with the highest contrasts. We, have, we can see from very high to low development in, air, in countries that are next to each other. So this comes with a cost. Uh, cancer mortality varies with development, and it's a very important mortality cause. 13% of the deaths in uh, 2008 were caused by cancer, and 70% of this proportionate amount of these deaths occur in, middle, uh, in low and middle income countries. This is from uh, Globocan, from the, uh, Ameri the cancers in the Americans. This shows the 15 major cancers, estimated age, standardized incidence or mortality, incidence in blue, mortality in red, for women and for men. What we can see is that in both cases, well, breast for women and prostate cancer for men are the leading cause, followed by lung and colorectal. Uh, and as I said, this is globally for women and men, but if we stratify by development, if we separate for women only the low and high development level, we can see that the liver, which was in, in low development cancers, the first cause of both incidence and mortality is cervix, uh, uterine uh, cancer of the cervix, followed by breast, then liver, stomach. We, we can see that liver, uh, with development, uterine cancer disappears, liver 
a Kaposi uh, sarcoma, esophagus, but we see uh, other cancers taking much higher uh, place with development, and that is breast, colorectal, lung, and, uh, and the corpus of the uterus, not the cervix. We can suspect in some cases why. So cervix, uterus, uh, ut uterine cancer, the, probably is VH, BPH, and the, uh, the benefits of having a medical service and doing Papa Nicolaus, that's saving, that saving so many women lives. Uh, Kaposis are common, we know it's AIDS, so in developed countries with decreased mortality and also incidence. And then there are, uh, uh, smoking is probably uh, the re an important risk factor behind increase with uh, development of the countries. And there are several, including the breast, which might be estrogen driven. When you have cancers that increase in this way, we have to think of environmental reasons. It's not genetic, it, it's consistent uh, with the degree of development, the same is happening for men. Prostate remains the first place, but is increasing much higher incidence. Although in developed countries we can reduce the mortality substantially, but the incidence is increasing and is very clear. So the, there is an ex, uh, uh, a study that shows very clearly that it's environmental. The reason of this increase is environmental. This is a study published in Nature Reviews uh, in which they show Japanese people in Japan and their, their incidence of cancers, stomach, breast, prostate, and colon. And they, are, they moved to, the, to Hawaii and they studied the first and the second generation of these peoples and compared with the local white Caucasian Hawaiians. Look at the stomach cancer. The stomach cancer is, is extremely high in Hawaii, and the first generation and the second consecutively decrease that risk substantially. We see an inverse, uh, unfortunately, the uh, subsequent generations are in, have a, an increased risk of, of breast cancer, uh, prostate and colon in less degree. So this clearly shows that is the place where you live. It's probably the lifestyle, it's the diet, who knows, but it's something that is associated with development. I started studying Helicobacter pylori. Uh, this was my first microbe of the human microbiome uh, before the, all the sequencing technology uh, came. And as you know, uh, H. pylori, uh, it was, the Nobel Prize in 2005 was given to uh, Marshall and Warren for the, their discovery of the bacterium and its role in gastritis and peptic ulcer disease. We know that is the main cause of cancer, gastric cancer. Uh, in particular, there are strains that have a, a, an area of the genome which is considered a pathogenicity um, a gene or set of genes. Uh, in which, uh, for the misfortune of the Spanish-speaking people, it's called CAGA. Uh, <laughs> it, it has also CAGB, CAGC. Uh, but CAGA, CAGA positive strains, what they have is a way to interact much closer to the host. They not only attach to the epithelium, they attach to the epithelium, project a protein that is a syringe, and inject a protein inside us. And that, that protein is CAGA, and this syringe is also coded in the pathogenicity island. That is subsequently phosphorylated, and it <coughs> produces a cascade of important events. It's a, it's a very intimate um, signaling that the CAGA positive cells can do. The CAGA negative cells interact from the outside in the membrane, but don't, don't do this. What happens to CAG is CAG is phosphorylated with interaction to SH2 uh, domain of the uh, PTP, of the protein phosphate, and eventually it ends by several routes 
uh, to increasing abnormal mitogenic signals, apoptosis, uh, and disrupts the cell, cell cycle. We know also that in CAG positive strains, we respond with, with more inflammation. That's also a risk of uh, oxidative damage, etc., in comparison with CAG negative strains. This is a slide uh, from posterior to the, to the Nobel Prize, and not uh, Mar Marin, Marshall and Warren uh, didn't study cancer, but this slide shows the association of H. pylori and CAGA status with the development of intestinal type uh, gastric adenocarcinoma. So if we take H. pylori people, H. pylori negative people, and therefore obviously CAGA negative, and we adjust the odd ratios to one, and we see the odd ratios for H. pylori CAG negative people, having H. pylori CAG negative increases 2.7 times the risk of cancer. But if you have a strain of you, if you if you have strains that have CAG A, your risk is almost double. Uh, the reason the response in the hosts, uh, I told you that CAG A is phosphorylated, but the degree of phosphorylation varies also between strains. So inflammation depends on how many phosphorylation sites there are. The phosphorylation sites are called epia motifs, and it happens that the epia motifs are of, are of four kinds, A, B, C, and D, and they repeat or not uh, in a geographic, with geographic differences. So the Asian peoples have epia known as ABD. They don't have the C type. In Western, we can have one, two, or three uh, sites of phosphorylation with these strains having the more phosphorylation and being the more that uh, lead to inflammation. So the, you can see the, co the complexity of the problems. Uh, and the, and these, these strains would be more associated to host response and therefore to cancer risks. We started uh, one of the first papers in collaboration with uh, the um, Marty Blazer's lab in NYU was this paper in which we show that there are geogra geographic signals also observed in other genes. So this is another gene of Helicobacter. What we did was compare strains in Venezuela from the Amazon, from Amerindians, and from Caracas, uh, sequence the gene and compare with other strains whose, whose sequences were available. And what you can see is that all Caracas strains cluster with Europeans, but the majority of Amerindian strains cluster in Asia with Asian strains. And that shows ancient carriage. And you may know or not that the reason of this is that our Amerindians are Asians. They, um, after the speciation of Homo sapiens in Africa, humans migrated everywhere the big wave of migration came towards east and the last continent to be populated by humans were the americans with several waves of migration the most important one being from mongolia crossing the bering strait and a little group of indians cross and then the population expanded to what today we know as the inuits in the north to many ethnias everywhere uh, that still, they, these have been the peoples that are the most marginated peoples in the Americans. They were, they still are. Uh, and we can phenotypically realize that they look Asian in, in many cases, sometimes like Japanese. And they're helicobacters too. So a uh, posterior work after our paper, a uh, beautiful work published in science with strains from all over the world uh, this was done by uh, the group of Mark Ackman in Germany. They show that there are five ancestral populations. The original African is red, and this is South Africa only. This is carried by the San Bushman of Namibia and Botswana. And then this ancestral evolved in four subpopulations, two, uh, one African, two European, 
and the Asian. And if you and these are mixing, of course, especially today in the world with mixing of peoples, but still the majority of the Asian strains are yellow, but also in the Americans wherever in the Americas wherever there are Amerindians, you find the blue African in Africa and wherever there are African there are people with African ancestry. Uh, and the Europeans in Europe and wherever, and these signals are disappearing because people are mixing. And that's a problem in which we are still working. We want to understand uh, what's happening with the mixing and how does that affect uh, the bacteria. So, but the point is that by ge geographic isolation during the migrations, the genetic drift that happens when you separate two populations and selection factors have led to human divergence, all the human populations that we knew, we know now, but also to H. pylori divergence and probably any other member of our microbiota. We have shown in a recent paper with Steve Massey that also Cagpi, the whole pathogenicity island, when we sequence it from an Amerindian strain and we do the phylogeny, the phylogeny corresponds to the phylogeographic with the Africans, African strain in the very root of the tree, then the Europeans, then Asians, then the Amerindians, just like the human phylogeny would indicate. So a lot of phylogeographic signal which indicates coevolution, coevolution with that precise human population. Despite of being a pathogenicity island, or so we know it as, then we select for it. Humans maintain the CAG island. When you transfer to mouse, mice delete the, the uh, part of the pathogenicity island. Uh, and then therefore, they are, these, are, these strains are incapable of injecting CAG A. They lose the syringe, they lose the protein, part of the protein uh, that is injected. And, uh, we have also shown in that paper with uh, Steve that humans select in differentially. The highest selector in favor of Kage are um, Amerindian helicobacter strains. So even within humans, not only humans sele select in general, but it seems that Amerindians select in favor of Kage much stronger. That might be the reason why Kage is more prevalent in Asia. So another <coughs> relevant point uh, to Helicobacter is the way it colonizes. It, it has to attach to the epithelium, and it uses adhesins that recognize blood group antigens. The blood group, as you know, are O, A, and B, and H. pylori can attach to those. We Part of the bottleneck of the Amerindians, when they arrive the, of the, to the Americas, that little group that crossed, that, was, that didn't carry the whole diversity of humans, they were, they were a product of successive bottlenecks as they move. Not everybody move, up, move out of Africa, right? A sample move out, turn to Europe, and then a sample of that move east, and a sample of that moved to Mongolia, and a sample moved to the Americas. All, all the Amerindians have only O blood group. There is no A or B. And it, that's very relevant for H. pylori because H. pylori uses the blood groups to bind. And this is a graph showing the distribution of uh, blood human groups in human populations. All these are um, Amerindians. When you start seeing in Eskimos A and B, that means they have mixed. They, because originally they were all, all group. Uh, we, in collaboration, we gave one of our strains to a person, uh, well, to a group in Ireland who was studying binding, and realized that the Amerindian strain could only bind O blood group, were unable to bind A and B, uh, as the Europeans or African strains do. So any. Any strain that is not Amerindian binds the three blood groups. Amerindians can only bind O. That's another indication of coevolution. He did a beautiful job. We just gave the strain, but um, Thomas Boren 
uh, went all over the world and demonstrated that 95% of the strains worldwide are generalists. They bind to the three blood groups. And Amerindian strains bind to all. This is important, this is relevant for transmission because if an Amerindian mother who is blood O marries a mestizo A or B and the baby is not O, the mother will not transmit the strain to the baby because the, the, the father's strain will be more competitive. So, and this is relevant because instead of being matrilineal transmission as we believe the microbiome is, uh, it all, will also be patrilineal or... The other interesting question is that because the host diversity decreases because of the bottleneck, we ask the question if, if this gradient of genetic diversity in the host is also reflected in the microbes. So we could do that with H. pylori. It's a great model to do all this stuff. And we, we say, well, if H. pylori adapts to the specific host, do Amerindian strains have lower diversity? That would be expected. They, they circulate in more homogeneous hosts than mestizos. And this is, by the way, a photograph of the Amerindians. When we go back, we don't recognize the kids. It's like, a little like the Japanese. They look so much alike. Uh, where, whereas mestizos, and this is a birthday party of my daughter in Caracas. And look at all the colors, brown, you know, dark, very clear. It's very phenotypically evident. We uh, answered this question in collaboration with Maria Gle Perez, who is also here at UPR, a statistician from uh, Luis Perici's group. And we studied 141 isolates from Africa, uh, Asia, Amerindians, European, and South American mestizos. And we sequenced seven genes this time, not one. And what we found, this is the uh, phylogeographic affinity. From Africans, we could only find H. pre-Africa 1. All the Asian strains were East Asians. All the European strains, uh, all the Spanish strains were European. But Amerindians had two types. Half had European, half had Amerindian. This is with seven genes. And mestizos, we thought they would have, we could find any, because they are a mix of Africans, uh, Amerindian, and Spanish. And we only found mostly European and African. The Amerindian strains disappear in mestizos. They don't, you, you can't find them. You find the successful one is European, and in minor proportion, Africa. And the, to answer the question, the question, the answer is yes. The least diverse the host, the lower diversity of the H. pylori populations that you can um, isolate. The highest diversity we thought it was going to be Africa because Africa is the highest, uh, the most diverse continent, but the mestizos are even more diverse, which is also not that surprising. Huge, uh, huge variation, huge variance, but the diversity in mestizos is much higher. And this is, this is the uh, bacteria that has co-evolved with the man. So it really matches what happens with the host. In addition, the, the bacteria recombines. So if you put two strains together, they interchange material. And we are interested in the question, who is the donor and who is the recipient? Because if you put a blue strain with a yellow, you can subvert, one will give to the other, and if you allow to give enough, they both will become either blue or yellow. So the direction is, is unidirectional. Of course, it happens in a community, in a population where you have diversity, but we ask, we, we wanted to see if we could get signals of other populations in a single strain. Look what the Amerindian strain has, green, in this gene. So that means European, one European helicobacter or more donated, and there is a signal of Europe there. Look, Spain. Spain has a lot of blue, Africa. Well, no wonder. Spain was Arab for 800 years. You, you, can, you can understand the movements of people and reconstruct just by looking at the mixing of bacteria. So you can really do 
um, anthropology, just looking at the bacteria. What happens in the Americans is this. America was free of people before 30,000 years ago. Then the Amerindians came from Asia. Therefore, wherever there were humans, there were only old blood groups, Asian strains. Then comes the colony um, and brings first uh, European and soon after Africans, and that happened only 500 years ago. But now, if you want to find an Asian strain, you have to go very deep in the Amazon and sample the pe people that have not mixed. What are the implications for risk disease risk? We don't know. Uh, it's an open question. And uh, we, right now, what we are doing is doing in vitro work, putting strain together, and studying recombination. We already know if you put a, European, a Spanish uh, strain from Madrid with an Amerindian Guajibo from Venezuela, this, the Amerindian Guajibo will take up the DNA of the Spanish and subvert and convert into a blue. And we, are, we want to understand why are they so competent? Why do they take up DNA? Why that, what confers resistance to the Spanish strain? So the point, the take home message is not only is there competition for binding and colonizing the host first, but also when they recombine, who wins in subverting the other? Who gives more DNA for the other to take up? Not only Amerindian strains are disappearing, all Helicobacter pylori are disappearing with modernization. So this is a prevalence in the US by age and year of birth <clears throat> in males and females. Everybody had <clears throat> people born in, at the beginning of last century, most people, above 90%, had H. pylori. Today, it's very hard to, have, to find a kid younger than seven years old, which is positive. You have to go to the Amazon or to Africa, where they have the very high prevalences. Uh, the trends in gastric cancer reflect this, and this is consistent. If H. pylori is the cause of gastric cancer, then if it's disappearing, we do see a, de a tendency to disappear in the, in the developed uh, world. And that has happened really in the last century. I mean, we, we see all this trend in the last century. What this means is there has been a big impact against our microbes during the last century when we discover antibiotics, they, we started using them in the 50s. So we, we have adopted a lifestyle with a lot of antimicrobials in our lives. And Helicobacter is one of them. We want to know who else has, is disappearing because that may be important for health. This is uh, the status of and development of adenocarcinoma by site. And uh, as I showed you, the gastric cancer, as long as it's not in the cardia, cardia, Helicobacter increases the risk, in this study is almost eight times. But look at the non-cardiac cancer, Helicobacter protects. So when you have a, when you have an, a bacterium that is selected by the human, that has co-evolved by the human, and you find it does something bad, it doesn't, it's a symbiont that belongs to us. You have to expect that something positive must have uh, been in the, in the function of this bacterium because we have selected for it. So we happen to have discovered first a bad effect of H. pylori on us, but now we know it causes non-cardiac cancer but protects against cardiac cancer. So that, this shows how complex it is. It's not surprising for biologists because you would expect a, a microbe that has co-evolved with the host has to have a positive, especially you would expect it in early ages. And it happens that the bad effect of H. pylori appears after reproductive age. Cancer is a, is a disease of the old. Uh, there is now enough evidence that H. pylori is good, is, is better than worse for kids. It's, it's, a, it's good that kids have it. And probably if you live long, long enough, you it would be better to get rid of it. These are the rates of three uh, gastrointestinal uh, diseases, uh, gastric cancer, a duodenal ulcer, 
both decrease with as, as, as H pylori disappears, but reflux increases, and that's a risk factor for cardiac cancer. Um, this is a rare cancer that, however, is increasing at tremendous rates. This is still rare, but it was much rare, rarer before, uh, and that is esophageal adenocarcinoma. It's also inversely relate, related to H. pylori. So we, we, we were like this. <coughs> Amerindians are still like this. Sand Bushmen in Africa are still like this. And they don't have adenocarcinomas. They, if they live long enough, they have an increased risk of gastric cancer. We have become like this now. This is, we know it's not natural. We were never like this before. So we want to understand the implications. What happens to the stomach that is free of H. pylori? <clears throat> we, we, we did a study uh, with Ana Maldonado, who was my student um, that is now at University of Massachusetts, where we study uh, four people, HP negative, and the whole community of this, their stomach. <clears throat> in this time, in this uh, paper, we use phylochips. Uh, not sequencing, and we studied uh, 10 H. pylori positive people from Amerindian origin or Asian and African, and we found not only the, that H. pylori have, uh, H. pylori people have H. pylori, but also that H. pylori people have other things, and basically <coughs> uh, there is an inverse correlation. The lack of H. pylori makes the stomach community to look like this, and the presence of H. pylori um, makes the stomach community to look like this. I don't, I'm not going to go into details, but just to have clear that the lack of H. pylori means much more than lack of H. pylori. It means basically that the stomach of H. pylori people is full of a much more complex community than the, sto the stomach of uh, H. pylori positive people. <coughs> So I've been talking about the bacteria. <coughs> what about the human? There have been studies showing that if you change H. pylori status, it affects your immunity. And this is, <coughs> these are gastric cells in the stomach of interferon gamma, IL-4 or IL-10 in people with or without H. pylori. And we, what we can see is that the H. pylori people have much higher local immunity, but also general immunity. They have more higher circulating T cells. We know that H. pylori positive people respond better to tuberculosis. They, they, respond, they have a better uh, immune response to tuberculosis, on, not only interferon gamma, but Th1. <coughs> we also know that people who lose H. pylori, after losing H. pylori, they increase their levels of ghrelin. Ghrelin is the hormone, the hormone that makes you eat, that increases the appetite. And apart from that, uh, modulating the metabolism, it does a lot of things, not only eating behavior. It influences many parts of the body. And we have seen that eradication of hel helicobacter increases slightly the BMI. We, what we don't know is how accumulative it is, if, how it happens uh, in generations that have never had H. pylori before. These are adults that have lost H. pylori. And we know that the world, as the economist recently said in a very nice article, the, the world is round. <laughs> These are the incidence of obesity. It's not overweight, obesity in the world, in men, and more importantly, in women are amazing. And not only the United States, but you see Arab countries, very high. Brazil is increasing dramatically. So the disappearance of H. pylori, and again, H. pylori could be a marker for the disappearance of many other bacteria. Uh, it changes the, human, the organ microbiota, microbiota, but also the host immune response. Hormones 
and cancer risks. And what we know is that we see with Helicobacter decreased cancer, cancer risk, which is a very good thing. But we, we see increases in uh, other uh, cancers, adenocarcinomas of the esophagus. And I haven't shown you data, but it increases obesity, asthma, atopic dermatitis, and these are diseases associated with modern lifestyle. I want to finish uh, acknowledging my uh, collaborators, uh, who are many, but in particular, Rob Knight and Jose Clemente, with whom I work very closely on um, studying the microbiome sequencing, high, using high throughput sequences. Rob is the designer of the analytical methods and programs uh, to study communities. Marty Blazer, who is a leader in the mi microbiota studies. Ana Maldonado, who did the study of the stomach. My long time collaborators from Venezuela, uh, Glida Hidalgo, who is an anthropologist. Mon Monica Contreras, a microbiologist. Magda Magris, a medical doctor, epidemiologist, who lived 30 years with the Yanomamis. Uh, Francisco Salzano and Maria Cachira Bortolini from anthropologists from Brazil. Salzano is a very uh, recognized figure in the field of anthro human anthropology. And my students with, from University of Puerto Rico with whom I couldn't do uh, anything and you may recognize Ana Maldonado Dos who is around somewhere. Uh, and these are really the engines that you know, move the projects in the lab. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer. Our second speaker of the afternoon, um, we have the privilege of having Dr. Francisco Javier Torres Lopez, who is from the Unidad de Investigación en Enfermedades Infecciosas, Hospital de Pediatría, Centro Médico Nacional, Siglo XXI, Instituto Mexicano del Seguro Social, México, Distrito Federal, México. Y él va, and he will be addressing us in the second topic of the afternoon, which is um, searching biomarkers for the early detection of gastric malignancies. Dr. Torres. Thank you. Um, I would like to thank uh, Eric for this very kind invitation to come to Puerto Rico. And uh, of course, I have to pay for the visit and keep this talk. But <laughs> it, is, it is also my pleasure to talk with you about what we do in the lab and, 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 and share with you many of the questions raised by this very intriguing infection, which, in fact, uh, Maria already, with uh, her excellent talk, gave us a very, very nice introduction on, on the rule of H. pylori, where we, don't, we do not have any doubt that it is a very strong risk factor for gastric cancer. But we have no doubt that it is also uh, an organism which has co with us. And then it is not easy to say this is a bad guy, we have to, to kill it all. So we have to study more and then, then decide where and when to treat. And, and, and that is what I'm going to try to present you. Um, just by telling you some of the studies we have been doing looking for a potential biomarkers to detect early before the uh, gastric malignants appear. So let me just uh, start by saying that, as Maria already said, H. pylori is an infection which starts very early in life. We, we usually get the bacteria when we are infants, and, and, and soon uh, the bacteria establish a dialogue with the gastric epithelia where He's speaking by, by secreting many different proteins, and then the host also responds by trying to balance this interaction and responding by a very equilibrated inflammatory response. But the, the fact is that, as we already also heard, um, in most of the cases, this chronic gastritis, this chronic inflammation, is not a disease state, and, and, and we can live with this inflammation for all of our life. Most of the cases, almost 80% of the people who get the infection will, will live forever, with, happily with the infection. But then we have those cases where something starts to, to, to come wrong, and then uh, this, this um, dialogue is broken, and then um, 
the, the reaction of the patient may, may lead to um, a damage like atrophy in the stomach and then this atrophy will increase the risk for pneumoplastic lesions like intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia. And finally, gastric cancer when we are already old. So, so this is a, um, uh, the natural history of gastric cancer is, is a very long history. It takes decades for since it started to, to end in, in disease. So it is very complex really to, to model these kind of diseases because of these very chronic, long-lasting interaction which finally ends up in, 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 in gastric cancer. So um, if we think on, on what we already heard also that uh, this infection or this, uh, the presence of this bacteria in many cases is is, is, is beneficial maybe. So uh, we have a, a, um, a window where we want to detect those cases which will go to gastric cancer before they, they reach this no return point, meaning that uh, uh, um, uh, we want to, to, to identify those where this balance between the uh, bacteria and the host is, 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 is broken and then when, when, when they damage, the irritation to, to, the, to the epithelium start to cause damage and then we can, we can prevent the, the appearance of gastric cancer. But we do, not, we do not want to eliminate all these bacteria because of all things we already heard from our previous talk. So we also have to understand that uh, this is a multifactorial disease. And, and so uh, we have uh, talked about the bacteria. We know that uh, uh, there are strains which are more aggressive, more virulent, and, and those who have, for instance, this pathogenicity island are more associated with gastric cancer, but also other virulence factors. But we also know that uh, the host has a an important role to play, and that, I mean, the genetics of the host, mainly on, on the um, inflammatory um, reactions of mediators, can also have a role on, on, on this for gastric cancer, and also many other environmental factors. So that when we, when we are trying to study uh, markers which can identify uh, patients at risk for gastric cancer, we can, I mean, we have to think on all these, on all these uh, uh, factors and and so um, I will give you a, a brief description of what we have been done in, in in the site of the bacteria, some of the genetic factors of H. pylori and disease, and I will also present you some of the results we have on inflammation markers and and, and, and in, during the the, um, the infection, and then finally I will try to 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 summarize what we are beginning to see on the possible rule of bacterial versus host factors as biomarkers in the clinic. So let's start talk about H. pylori and genetic factors. We, we first study the in vivo expression of, of different virulence factors. So, so we, we ask if we could identify those factors which are more expressed during disease and, and uh, so that to begin to, to, to define which one were those more important to go to further studies and, and look for the association with disease. So um, in, in this study, we, we uh, selected patients with non-atrophic gastritis, duodenal ulcer, and gastric cancer, and look for the in vivo expression of, of different environments. And so uh, we got the patients, uh, we, we took biopsies from different regions of the stomach, and then we extracted RNA from, from this, directly from these biopsies, and by RT-PCR, look at the in vivo expression of the, of the genes. And, uh, and of course, uh, one of the main um, um, genes we, we were interested on was the genes on the pathogenicity and the genes that uh, uh, Dr. Dominguez already told us, uh, uh, illustrated the role of many of these proteins in, 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 in building this uh, secretory system which inject uh, CAG A and other proteins to the epithelial cell. So, so we sequence, um, I mean, we, we look for the in vivo expression of the genes of the island 
And, and just briefly show you that uh, gastric cancer is in red, two organ adults in blue, and non-atrophic gastritis in green. And you can see that many of the genes of the island were expressed significantly more in the case of gastric cancer. And I want you to, to, to keep in mind this one. This, this is CAC E or CAC 23. And, and this is a, a, a gene which encodes for a protein that gives energy to the whole system. So it is a, a, key, a key gene for the function of the island. And, and, and we saw uh, that in vivo it's, uh, it's significantly more expressed than in the case of ulcer or non-atropic gastritis. We also look for other genes, uh, particularly genes which were involved in, in adhesion and, and, or in um, BAC a uh, cytotoxin which modulates apoptosis and can also cause direct epithelial damage. And, and we also found that some of these genes were significantly more expressed in, in, in gastric cancer. And in fact, if we take uh, the expression of all these virulent genes, uh, and do uh, an, an analysis of correlation, we found that uh, gastric cancer is significantly different from uh, chronic gastritis and duodenal ulcer. And, and, and on the contrary, <coughs> chronic gastritis and duodenal ulcer are more rare. So meaning that uh, you, we do have a different pattern of in view expression when we see patients with gastric cancer. <coughs> so, um, so we can conclude from this part that the in vivo expression of viral genes in, in gastric cancer are different from those in patients with non-atrophic gastritis or duodenal ulcer. And, and we can also suggest that some of these genes might be good candidates for further studies, not only on the pathogenesis on the disease, but also maybe they could be uh, useful as biomarkers. So we, we continued the study of, of, of these uh, genes, in, particularly in the island, and what we did was to, to ask if we could see any diversity in these genes which would be associated with disease. So um, we then selected uh, genes which were CAGA, which is uh, recognized as an oncoprotein, and we also selected some other genes of the island which are involved in the um, direct interaction between the um, surface of the bacteria and the epithelia. And, 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 and of course, we included CAGI or CAG23, the one I already showed you that it was significantly more expressed in vivo. So just to, to, to summarize, uh, we did this study in, in, in fact in, in, in samples from me Mexican and Venezuelan patients. And so we included cancer cases and, and gastric and non-anthropic gastritis patients. And, and so um, we then sequenced the, the, the genes and then looked for diversity. And, and what we found is that uh, we, there is a, a significant uh, in, uh, frequency of nucleotic differences, particularly in genes like CAGA, C, and GAN. And if you look at these um, uh, nucleotide differences, uh, many of the, those are non-synonymous vari variants, particularly in CAG A. And this, of course, leads to amino acid differences, which is uh, functionally important. And, and, and so that uh, we, we saw that uh, uh, there was 30% uh, amino acid differences in CAG A, but also 23 in CAC C and, and almost 20 in CAC CAM. So, so there are genes which have a, a more variation than others in, in this, uh, uh, from this pathogenicity island. And then when we look for um, association with gastric cancer and, and we studied all the, the whole sequences, we identified uh, point uh, variants, SNPs that had some association with gastric cancer. Um, just let me show you that uh, we found some significant in, in CAG A, some significant in, in CAG E, in CAG L, and also in, in, in CAG Kama. But most important is that we identified one position which change give to a 
strongly significant association with gastric cancer. And this SNP was in CAG E, the, the, the protein which gives energy to the system. So, so uh, it, it is a, a very, very intriguing and, and strong association with this variant and gastric cancer. And uh, as I said, CAG E is the, is the gene which encodes for the ATPs, the, 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 the uh, enzyme which gives uh, energy to the system. And, and we identify different point variants in, in the gene that were associated with, with gastric cancer. Particularly, this is the, the one which gives the strongest. And, but we also identify in, in, in a small protein like CAG gamma in this very small gene compared to the others, many, many different uh, variants which were associated with gastric cancer, suggesting also that maybe this is a protein important for uh, possible markers of risk for disease. So uh, in conclusion from this study, we, we show that polymorphisms in genes coding for energy supply, uh, and I'm talking about CAGI, and also for the uh, recognition of, of, of integrin on the surface of the epithelium, and I'm talking about Kagel, may affect virus, may affect the uh, association with disease. We, we also documented that uh, this genetic variation was higher in genes which are encoding proteins, which are exposed to, to the host milieu, which are exposed to the reaction of the, of the uh, gastric epithelium. And, and so, I mean, we, again, we think that maybe these, these variations can be potential biomarkers for detection of patients at risk. So what have we done on the other side, on the side of the host? Uh, um, we, we began by studying different markers for inflammation and also looking for association with disease. And, this is just, I mean, something that uh, Maria already told us that uh, the uh, presence of these bacteria is resulting in a very strong uh, reaction by, by the host, uh, particularly a, a very <coughs> strong uh, activation of polymorphous macrophages by the, uh, an array of proteins created by, by the bacteria, including the, the CAG A, which is directly injected into the cell by the, the secretory system. So, so all these um, network of cells and inflammatory mediators are then um, a, a very fertile field to study for possible uh, patterns of markers for, for disease risk. So um, what we did uh, was to look for diagnosis prediction. And for that, we used this multiplex platform where we, you can study uh, many, many inflammatory mediators in a very small sample using these uh, microbeads with, in the Luminex system. And, and using a similar system, we also studied uh, different H. pylori antigens and also the, uh, the uh, known marker for atrophy levels of pepsinogen. And, and, and we look for um, class prediction rather than class comparison. And I mean by that, that we were more interested in looking at the uh, prediction accuracy as, as metric of interest rather than uh, statistical significance. Uh, thinking on, 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 on markers for use in the clinic. <coughs> So for this study, we, we included patients with non-atrophic gastritis, duodenal also, patients with uh, pineoplastic lesions, and also a group of patients with gastric cancer. And so what we, we did uh, uh, in, in the design of the study was to divide all the samples in different batches and then look for consistency and reproducibility so that we can identify markers who gave a significant association with gastric cancer in at least two of the batches. And then uh, we, we, we um, look for, for a prediction using this time only the uh, Luminex for 
inflammatory <laughs> mediators. And, and uh, you see in this line the uh, comparison between non-atropic astritis and metaplasia, and you see that uh, cross-validated prediction using these markers resulted in a 66% accuracy. And, but when we look at the uh, comparison between non-atropic astritis and gastric cancer, the, using this, this um, pattern of markers, we, we found a prediction uh, of almost 80%. But so, so um, if we compare the, these uh, markers with the bacterial markers, we, what we found is by looking at different antigens of the bacteria as markers, we, in this case, and also using the same type of analysis, we found a prediction accuracy when we look for uh, preneoplastic lesions against non-atrophic gastritis of 64. And, 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 and in this case, uh, a very low prediction, 55%, when we compare the non-atrophic gastritis versus gastric cancer. And if, if we now use CAGA, which already heard that it is a very strong virulence factor, and, and, and study the uh, prediction of having this antigen, we, we found that uh, the prediction was really low for when we compared non-atrophic gastritis versus metaplasia, and also when we compared non-atrophic gastritis versus gastric cancer. So it come, came up not as good as we expected. And now, if we if we do the analysis um, mixing these these two types of markers, the markers of inflammation. And in the proteins of the uh, bacteria, we, we found that uh, uh, when we use this cross-validated uh, prediction, we found that non-atrophic gastritis versus metaplasia was a prediction of 58. But in the case of non-atrophic gastritis versus gastric cancer, we found a prediction of 85%, which is really good. So um, we can conclude that uh, the uh, factors we tested from the host, from the inflammation, uh, perform better than the uh, H. pylori uh, antigens as markers for disease. But we also found that the use of both host and bacterial markers may, may improve the uh, prediction accuracy. Let me just finish by, by telling you a um, uh, very recent work we, we began by looking at glycomics and the association with gastric cancer. And, and glycomics is the, the pattern of uh, glycosylation of proteins, particularly in serum, where, where we, we, we can find association with diseases as we already know. And then so we, we, we wonder if we could also find some association in gastric cancer. So, um, uh, we took plasma and then we, we rounded samples through uh, uh, mass spectra we using uh, MALDI equipment and, and then released different um, uh, fractions, structures of, of glycans from the proteins using different concentrations of solvents. And, and, and these structures were then um, looking for any association with, with gastric cancer. And, so uh, in, in this graphic, what we have is the, how they behave in the case of gastric cancer in red and loaded and also in black, comparing with the, the frequency of, the, of these um, glycomarkers in non-atrophic gastritis. So you can see that there were some structures which were significantly less frequent in gastric cancer and others which were significantly more frequent in gastric cancer than uh, in the group of non-atrophic gastritis. And um, these um, were fucosylated complex type compounds that, uh, and high mannose type and glycans which show this uh, stronger significant association between, uh, um, with gastric cancer. And also we found that uh, neuraminic acid containing complex were more significantly 
found in dwarf animals also. And so um, what uh, we know is that is, these glycans are usually correlated with IgG in, in serum. So um, we, we already began studies on IgG and trying to identify glycan markers in these proteins, which can potentially also be used as time markers for identification. So I'm um, just finished by saying that um, most of this work was, was done in, 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 in my lab in, in Mexico with the help of, of my collaborators and also in collaboration with people from a national public health institute in, in Cuernavaca in Mexico and also in collaboration with, with Jay Soldik in UC Davis and, and the group of Kanziani in Heidelberg in Germany and Dr. Ipuko from Wayne University. Thank you.